I forget it, if it was Apollo 15 or 16, but one of those two carried about a thousand first day covers to the moon. They would frank them and stamp them as being on the moon. And when they got back to Earth, allegedly, they would sell them for a huge profit. And NASA didn't like that. They thought this was an unacceptable activity and confiscated them all. But guess what? They've all managed to surface since then because they were being sold at ooh, several hundred dollars per cover. It was probably a pension fund for one of the astronauts. Yeah, and there was an astronaut that took rolls of quarters yes. to the moon. Surely they would know if they were taking additional weight with them. As you say, it costs many thousands of dollars to launch one pound into space. And they could have jeopardized the whole mission if they'd taken too much weight, because they wouldn't have enough fuel to get into orbit. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. And if you can't get into orbit, you can't get to the moon. If you can't get to the moon, you're done, dead. End of story. Yep. Yeah, that's the way it's always been, hasn't it? The risk involved in any amount of space flight far outweighs any other activity. I mean, the risk is there 100% of the time. The danger is there 100% of the time. And when it comes to vacuum, death would be basically instantaneous. All these guys that say, oh, well, you can float around there for 15 minutes and you blow up like they did with their dogs and brought them back in and they swell back down again. That's nonsense. I mean, LeBlanc just, boom, thang, <laughs> done. Yeah, instantly. And if they couldn't have got that air back in there. Within a few seconds, the arteries in his brain are going to pop and he's dead. Yeah, well, it's interesting because in that first video, we seen an astronaut with a one-eighth hole in his glove, and he was fine for 10 hours working out there. And then we see this other guy that's out there for half an hour, has a little rip in the outer coating of the glove, and they had to go right in. Which is it? Maybe they'll work it out one day. It may take a while to do it. Well, these new suits, I mean, they all have different problems with them, right? The old suits, you could have a hole in them. Didn't matter. The new suits, now you can't have a hole in them. Yeah, otherwise you'll boil. Except vacuum is a vacuum and never goes away. It's omnipresent danger, and the slightest little thing is going to take you out. If there's a mistake in just the way something was assembled, you lose a seal. Just going in and out through an airlock, I mean, if the thing doesn't seal, you don't have a hell of a lot of time left. I don't care how much backup oxygen and stuff you have on board it's going out the door <laughs> straight out the door yeah i mean yeah. even if it's a small leak you're just down to a few hours doesn't matter how you try and keep that up and of course before you run out of oxygen the air pressure is going to get low enough that you're dead anyway that's just one problem a cme hits how are you going to hide you can't if it's yeah. coming straight at you you're done Nothing you can do about it except NASA's latest wheeze to get out from a CME is to hide inside the water bottles. I mean, come on, guys, that's the best you can do. Hide inside the water bottles. And there's a film of them trying to create this hiding place inside the capsule. There isn't enough room. There isn't enough water. They can't lift that much weight into space to start with if it's all water. Of course they can't. Which is why they're trying to find water on the moon, save them carrying it there. Fat chance they got of doing that. Well, like I said, they can run over to the Apollo 17 flag and ring it out. Yep, they can. <laughs> if it's still there. Well, it's not on the moon. It's a flagstaff, so. In any vacuum, it will evaporate. I think they should update their museums and make sure the flag is wet on the display. It matches the photograph. Yeah, they won't do that because people might say, what's that water doing on the flag? It's supposed to be in space. It's a vacuum. It wouldn't be there. Oh, Most dear. Most people don't know. If they saw it, they wouldn't recognize it as being a problem. And we even have that under the comments. Like, well, so what the flags what? What's the problem? <sighs> God, what? Oh, dear. It's like yeah. that famous quote from Richard Feynman after the Challenger inquiry. No matter the requirements of PR, Nature cannot be fooled. And he should know, and he was quite right, nature cannot be fooled. Once you know what the science is, that there's a vacuum in space, and you know what a vacuum can do, 
it basically evaporates any moisture almost instantly. You can't lubricate anything. And you certainly can't have wet flags on the moon. I don't know in the 1960s, I mean, as far as lubricants go, they're going to, depending on how solid the grease is or whatever, right? It's still going to evaporate. Uh, some are just going to take longer than others. They didn't have dry lubricants the way we do today. We have graphite, which is a dry lubricant. They could have used those on bearings, like on the rover bearings on the thing, the transmission for the engines. They could have used dry lubricant in there because they're only going to run for a short period of time and then they're just going to leave it there. And then they're not running at high speed. It's 12 miles an hour. I don't know if you could use a dry lubricant in a camera. Probably debatable. But if they had used a dry lubricant, they would have told us by now. But they haven't told us. No. You could use talc as well. Yeah. Talc and graphite are dry lubricants. But inside a camera, floating around in space, that stuff would probably get everywhere inside the camera. Well, you're weightless. So it's going to get on everything. You'd have to make it stick. And that means you have to have moisture to it to make it stick. And if it has but, moisture to it, it'll evaporate. The rover would need to have some dry lubricant. The legs on the lander would need to have some dry lubricant, which is not in any of the documentation for them to slide because they're going to cold weld together. They're supposed to slide up and down 32 inches. And they've updated the file on at least four or five times so just on those legs alone. I still don't get it right. They put bushings in there now and everything else, and they went from two honeycomb things to crush to three. And then on the secondary stage, they made it go both directions. So they put a rod in it so it couldn't crush either direction, right? <laughs> Except when they keep forgetting, when they crush out, that's where it's going to stay. Yeah, of course it is. You can't have a rod inside a collapsible tube and not have it appear somewhere. Yeah, all of those things could have used that. But I've never seen any documentation on dry lubricants for any of the equipment, not even the newer stuff. You look at the testing from Joyce Deaver on all of the different lubricants and caulkings and everything else and window seals that they put in the chamber to see how they dry out. Most of them failed by 10 to the minus 3. They couldn't take 6. There's some tape called Tapcon or something that can get close to that, but they're out in minus 11, so it's not going to work out there anyway. But you never see them testing dry lubricants. No. Why don't we put an appeal out to all our NASA listeners and watchers to say, if there are dry lubricants which were used on Apollo, please direct us to the location of the information which you have about them. Please do it. We'd like to know. Yeah. I've never seen any PDF files on anything. Joyce Deaver, what, they were working, what, 15 years? 91 to 2005 or 6 is what the, she was doing the testing on there, right? I never saw anything on dry lubricants, and those lubricants were available in the 2000s. Why wouldn't they be using them? You'd think they would. I expect we'll get directed to people talking about Teflon, but that's not a dry lubricant. As far as the stop cold welding was using ceramic coatings and stuff like that. Well, maybe that would help, but... Those don't appear to have been used on the Hasselblad cameras. No, the camera would have to be completely different. Imagine how you'd have to do the shutters alone. Exactly. And the shutters on a Hasselblad, by the way, are metal, metal leaf shutters, six-part leaf shutters inside the lens. The lens was subject to the vacuum of space. The leaf shutters would have cold welded. Especially so, when they slide over top of one another, the little bit of friction is just going to grab them. So how were all those photographs taken? On the moon or here on Earth? I vote for here on Earth. Just zoom in on the camera on both of those. Yeah, standard Hasselblad, standard lens, 80 millimeter lens. Okay, look on the one on the left, look at the mounting bracket. On there, it's got a double rib. It's very, very square across the top, mounted in there, down. And look at the one on the right. It's just rounded. It's a whole different mounting bracket. You see the difference in between the two mounts? Yeah. Oh. Okay, now take a look at the top of the camera on the left camera. There's one switch on the camera. Look at the one on the right. It's got two. That lens is a 60 millimeter lens, not an 80 millimeter lens. Slight wide angle lens. Yeah. 
Now, the one on the left, on the back part of the magazine there, see that little tab sticking up there? Okay, it's not on the other camera. These are one photograph apart from each other. Completely different mount. By the way, where did this go here? This little com box here, it's not over here either. Doesn't this look like this camera mount is stuck to his arm? Almost. Yeah, it's very weird, that. very weird. Yeah. How would you get your arm in front of this, though? Yeah, look. Yeah, how do you get the shadow in front? How would you get your arm anywhere near this? Do you know how high your arm would have to be up? Oh, yeah. dear, up there. No, that is seriously weird. Is it showing the whole camera mount? Zoom in a little closer on that. Now, you see that camera mount compared to the other one? Yep. And then his arm's there, and there's a shadow there, which is on his arm for that camera mount. I don't know how you can do that. But you can see that there's two separate dials on the top of that camera compared to only one on the other one. Yeah, there is. And you see the photo number? It's 18019 and 18020, one frame apart. Yeah, somebody's goofed on the creation of that magazine series. I think what we're looking at is the fact that they probably went out and did a bunch of practice shots, came back and then came back out the next day or whatever and made some more. And they just decided to put it all together on one magazine, grab yeah. the best photos from each and put it on. And they're mixing and matching. That's how they've all created. But this is on the other side. This is the opposite side of this. But here's the tab. It's sticking right over top it's of the top up. here. So where is it then? Over here. That's right. And where's the other knob gone off the top? The dial. There's two dials up there on that one. That has a pointer. This doesn't. Well, if you call it a pointer, whatever. One's a little short one and uh, one's longer then. Right. But over here, it's a scale to tell you the settings for the yeah. film. That's what the point is pointing to when you turn it. But where is the pointer over here? It's gone. There's nothing there. Uh, you're right. Completely different. The mounting bracket itself is totally different. Yeah, it is quite different. One's curved, the other's bent. And even if you were to look at this on the other side, this is square. This is perfectly square. The whole bracket's perfectly square. This isn't. This is actually curved. Look at the curve in this. And then this also has a double bend in it up here. Now, even yep. though this is on the other side, there is the same over here. So this is the same over here as this over here. So where is it then? Where's that double plate? Not a double plate anything, is it? No. And that arm, which is the bit above the bracket on the right-hand side, the arm cannot be between the camera and the mounting. How on earth do you get that? Well, Photoshop hadn't been invented at that point, so it's obviously cut out and paste, cut and paste, literally. Yeah. They probably were working with two or three different magazines shooting this and put them all together over, they probably shot over a couple of days yeah. in practice and just put them all together. Right, but this bracket is mounted right onto the comm box here. There is no comm box. No, the arm's covering it. I think the box is there just underneath the arm. You just see a little bit of it. You sure? I can't, but there's the comm box. How can you get your arm in between this and the comm boxes? It would have to go right there in between here. There's mm. not enough room. There's nothing here. No, there isn't. You're right. It's a very strange picture, that one. And you start looking at it in detail. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at why the little bag is on the side of the camera. It's actually mounted on the camera, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how you can get an arm between this and the comm box because it would have to be between that bracket and the box. It doesn't matter how you look at that photograph. I mean, it looks like that arm has been set in place and almost pasted in there, right? Yeah, now pull the arm back. Where's the comm box? Yeah. This is even worse when you look at it this way. This yeah. bracket here in between his arm, that would have to actually be between that bracket in here. So he would, his arm would have to get in between that tiny little space there for this to show up like this. But that would mean this arm here, this is the arm that's in between here and here, though. This arm that's holding the pole. So how on earth is he getting that arm in between that tiny little space there? I don't know. I don't know how that is created, how it could be so different on the camera. 
and everything else appears to be the same. Like I said, from one photograph to the other, how can the camera become that much different? Mounting and everything else. More anomalies, more fakery. When they were practicing, they probably had dozens of cameras laying around that they could just grab. I was going to say that this came up before with Taffy a long time ago with this arm. It was Taffy that spotted this, actually. He thought it was pasted on. Yeah, he thought it was pasted on. And people were saying, oh, no, no, like Bertie Slack was saying, well, no, if you look really closely at the bottom, you can actually see the box to where that's attached to. I don't know. I can't. But that's not really the problem here. You know, the problem is, is that these are two different cameras and the bracket's different. So let's just go with that for now. Come on, NASA. If you think we're wrong, tell us and explain why. Don't just call us stupid names. Get your act together a bit. Don't forget, Marcus, we're biased because that's what two people said in the comments section. We're biased. Of course we're biased. We're biased against lies. We're biased against fabrication. Well, you see, we got people commenting saying, oh, 50 years and you've come up with nothing. <laughs> really? You know? Yeah. Well, if you're on the lunar surface and you have a camera attached to your suit, it's going to be the same camera in the next photograph and the next one after that and the next one after that. But this is one photograph, just one. Those images, I guess, if you went to the journal site, they'd be taken like a few seconds apart. Yeah, something like that, I would say. Is what would seconds. be in the timeline of it, and obviously not. And if you looked at those photographs longer, you'd probably see that maybe even the lighting has changed a little bit for angle or whatever, right? Because they, they could have stopped for lunch. For Jumped lunch. back in the suit and they put a different, you know. Union restrictions on the amount of time you can spend inside a space suit? Well, even if they stopped and took a break, you know, have a smoke, take their helmet off, have a smoke. They're going to take that damn camera off the front of them because it's right in the way of everything. It's going to come off. You're going to sit down, get in your lawn chair. You got a Playboy bunny on your lap. The camera is going to disappear. You finish taking your break, pop a camera back on. They just grab anyone off from the fourth wall. Yeah, right? and you get it wrong and nobody spots it. They're all continuity errors, these. They're minor points that most filmmakers do their very best to avoid happening because there are always people who will go through any film and spot the mistakes. And there are very, very few of them. And the ones they do find are quite amusing sometimes. But when we're told this is a documentary record of man's landing on the moon and we find that it's not properly created, because that's what it is, it's all created. The photographs were just assembled from a selection that they had, and they tried to make the best story they could, but they got it wrong. If you've never been to the moon, and if you're concentrating on creating that image, and you get focused on one thing in particular, a whole lot of other things disappear. Like, you're trying to pick that storyline out. So when you've got them landing on the moon, Neil's coming down the ladder. The entire focus is on that lunar set and those two people there. And then the script writers completely forget about the guy that's supposed to be orbiting. And they did that six times. And I don't know how many times I've brought this up. Nobody comments about it because it's not in the transcripts. They can't add it to the transcripts. They can't add communication to the transcripts on it because every second is accounted for. So they have to deny it happened. You can't tell me that they just forgot about a guy for three days. 15, 16, and 17. Guy orbiting for three days. Nobody talked to him. Didn't even do a countdown to take off to hook back up with him. Just forgot about him because they were that focused. Because the only thing that mattered to them was to get the images down on the lunar surface that they created. That was their entire focus. Everything else went out the window. And nobody could think of all of the details that needed to happen. And we're still probably missing a whole bunch more things that should have been happening in there. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, good point. Where's all the technical stuff after they landed to check everything out? You don't see them test the suits before they depressurize. I mean, I sure to hell want to make sure that the suit's working. Yeah, and don't forget that it took three technicians on Earth to put an astronaut into a suit. Where are those three technicians in the spacecraft 
on the lunar lander. They did it themselves. So you'd really want to check it out? Yeah, of course you do. If you wanted to get into it, I wouldn't let the air out of the bloody limb until I knew that spacesuit was functional. Of course not. Yeah. And that your backpack worked. There yes. needs to be a whole transcript and documentation of that conversation that they were having. Where is it? And it's not anywhere, is it? No, I've never seen any transcript of any checking of the spacesuit before they exit the lunar module. None. That would be over at least an hour. Yeah, of course it would. But let's say it'd be like to dress each other, if you could do it in a half an hour, because it took three guys, it took 45 minutes. Yeah. But let's say they're better than that, they can do it themselves in a half an hour doing that. There's a full hour transcript that needs to be documented of them discussing everything about that suit that they're putting on and the difficulty they're having doing it and everything else, right? And then those suits have to be recharged before you go out in EVA2 and EVA3. They got to yeah. fill them back up with water. They got to recharge all of the systems, put a new battery in it. And then test it as well. There's nothing in the transcript about any of that. Yeah, because when you use the 500, this is what they're showing. See, there's the double one right there. But when you go up to this one here, now it's only one. This one here, you have two on here. I don't understand. So what's going on with this one lever? Because there's the chart right there that that lever points to. Well, they might have broken one off. Well, they could have broken that little tab off. They could have broken it off. I mean, look at the way those guys are horsing around. Oh, look at this only has one. And then it's also almost impossible to take any photograph with a 500 millimeter lens without using a tripod, as one of the comments pointed out, because you get camera shake. You can't hold the thing still enough. There's the pointer. There's the pointer right there. Yeah, it is. But then you go to this one and there it is. There's only one there. That is a different camera. Yeah. But they're consecutive photographs. Should be the same camera, but they're not. No, and this time he's got it set this way, because there's the pointer. But where's the other half of it? I don't know. They're using the camera more like props. I'm sure that they worked. Yeah, they probably did work. I'm sure they're That's... taking a bunch of photographs out there. They would have to be taking the photographs because they couldn't allow anybody else on the set to make footprints. And Hasselblad wouldn't send cameras to NASA that didn't work. They would make sure they did because it was a very profitable business for them. And in fact, the more we look at it, the more ridiculous it gets. And we're now watching them trying to return to the moon. I think the more NASA looks at it, the more ridiculous it gets. That's why they don't make any comments. No, they don't. How many years have they been totally silent? Well, ever since David Percy asked them that embarrassing question to explain some of the anomalies in the photographs. And their reply was, we don't have time for this nitpicky claptrap, as if that is an answer. And they haven't said anything since. You see, and another problem this fellow has is that not only doesn't he realize that there's a console in the way of Buzz Aldrin, which is why he cannot kneel in that doorway the way he is, but we have another problem. He is indicating that their models that he's using rods or wires to hold the models up. Well, that's fine and dandy. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about models here. We're talking about full-scale mock-ups, which I have showed in that Apollo 11 LEM simulator. They're using full-scale mock-ups. Of course they are. And even if there's no fuel in the LEM that they're putting there on the set, which there wouldn't be, it's still going to weigh 20,000 pounds. The thing is 32 feet across and 24 feet high. And if it's a stripped out model, maybe it only weighs 10,000 pounds. That's why you see those large straps. That's why you see it laying on the ground there. Still has to be strong enough to support itself. And I also told him to take a look at how Brian Johnson made those Eagle spacecraft fly, those models. It says not only did he use wires, he had to also spray those wires black because they still reflected now, again, we're talking about models, but he also did another trick. He used to use a blackout blanket, and he would throw that over the back of the engines, and he had a pipe that connected to the back of the engine housing. And then when he moved the camera around it, it looked like it was in free flight. Now, 
again, he's trying to say that he uses rods and wires. Now, that's fine, but we're not talking about models here. We're talking full-scale mock-ups. They're not models. So wires are not going to work, are they? Unless he can find some piano cable that can hold 20,000 pounds. Well, the thing is, is the straps that are holding this machine are not physically in the shot. Funny thing is, though, they are in the shot because in Apollo 15, you can see the shadow of the strap flapping. So there is a strap there, but is that a piece of the same one that's laying on the ground? No, that's probably a control strap on the side to hold it from wandering side to side. The ones on the top, and especially in the hammer and the feather shot, that is very specifically designed so that you can lower down the straps down onto the machine and they just slide over the top of the legs quickly. So they got the four straps coming down onto the top of the legs, the way they're designed there. So when you start to pull up, the force of them pulling together holds them on there. And then when you let it down, you can very quickly release them. But the thing is in the comment section, we always get accused of lying or we get accused of not having any professors or PhDs or anybody that has the experience. And yet we do. We have Bill Demos. He is the Bachelor of Science with Honors, you know, physics department. We also have Tim Trumbull, 30 years special effects expert working in film on the Oxbury optical printer. We also have David Percy, a movie director, film producer, Marcus Allen, who has worked in photography for years in film. And here we go. We're right back to film. It's film cameras. It's not digital. We cannot emphasize that enough. And Dave McKeegan and his little groupies, they all work with digital cameras. I don't know. I haven't seen Dave hold up a film camera. To this no day, one. it's always digital cameras. And again, remember Marcus when he said, oh, he went into the chemistry shop and he asked this fellow for a roll of film. He was looking for a specific film. And the guy says, what's film? You see? So these guys don't know what film is because they haven't grown up with it. They don't know what it is. All they know is digital. So we have to keep going back to the same thing. It's film, film. Film, it's chemical. We're talking a chemical procedure here. This is not digital. And no matter how many times you tell these guys that, it goes right over their heads. The same thing going back to these models. It's not models. We're not talking miniature models here. We're talking about full-scale mock-ups. And that's the difference. That's why they made it look so real, because they were using all close to real craft if, when they were if doing they it. they were using little models, why the hell would NASA have a 600-foot-long by 300-foot-long gantry crane that lifts 180 feet in the air. Yeah, but not just that one. Look at the Apollo simulator. Look at the other ones for the Gemini simulators. I mean, these were massive, massive simulators that were in massive hangars. We're talking massive hangars. The equipment that is used to manipulate all of these mock-ups. It's same as the Gemini with the practicing the docking and undocking. Everything's full size. Now time for Science Guy, responding to a video we did one year ago where we were talking about Dave McKeegan and his lack of comprehension skills when he was looking at our videos and our emails to him, and he simply doesn't get it. This Now Time for Science Guy is trying to back up Dave. He claims we're lying, that we're mental, and Dave showed how the true colors of how clear you have lied in your correspondence. Well, it was Dave that was just misinformed. We didn't lie. He was just simply misinformed. However, he picked out a particular photograph, which happens to be Buzz Aldrin, which I'm going to include in here. And it's Buzz Aldrin coming out of the LEM in Apollo 11. He's on his knees and he claims that he's a visual effects artist who works with 3D models. And he looked at the photograph and he said, there's absolutely no reason why Buzz couldn't be standing or kneeling in the door frame. 
But what he doesn't understand is he didn't look at the rest of what we had done showing that the console is on the inside of that machine and that Buzz could not be standing there. You can't have two objects occupying the same space. All he's looking at is the outside on the photograph. He has to realize that the inside of this machine is supposed to have a lot of hardware in it. And obviously this one doesn't because Buzz has his PLSS is right up against the door frame. And there's an entire console there that exceeds in there more than a foot, only one inch above that door frame. He just doesn't get it. Now it's time for science guy says he's a 3D modeling effects. The other thing he was making a comment on was that if you're going to use special effects that you'd use wires and whatever that uh, you could remove or you could filter out. And I was talking about the Apollo 15 landing where the gantry cables broke and the thing came down and crashed fairly hard on the ground. Like one side of it was touching, the other side was still in the air over top of that little crater and the leg come down, you can see it visually in the landing effects on it. You hear the comments from the astronauts when they're doing it. And the strap is visible in the photograph of the hammer and the feather. It's there laying on the ground. There's no way a strap of that size. I mean, that thing probably holds four to five tons, that particular strap laying on the ground beside the hammer and the feather. It's clear to see. It's just left there. You can see the rest of the garbage and the other broken pieces that were there when that thing landed and he's claiming oh they would use little tiny wires and they'd use this for the you know special effects would be doing that well what he doesn't realize because he doesn't comprehend anything that we say is that the gantry crane is holding the lamb just as they do in other practice simulations and lowering it to the ground the camera is mounted in the window pointed straight at the ground the straps are not in the shot. They can be as big and heavy as they want to be because they're not physically in the shot. And I don't know, and he also claims that we have no qualifications to analyze these photographs in any way, shape, or form, other than the fact that we have with us on board not only Marcus Allen, David Percy, Bart Sabrell, Tim Trumbull, and these guys know more about film and everything else out there. And just because this guy likes to play with Dave and his little telescope, neither one of them have ever even held a bloody film camera. Say we're not qualified? You better sit down and watch our videos. We'll show you what qualifications we have. We have. We have.